Thank you very much, Tyler. And Brian, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Fresh, fresh off these results that the market appears to like very much. Stock's up 6.3%. How, how much of a driver do you think rising rates are for your business right now? Well, Sarah, thank you for having us. And, uh, you know, in the end of the day, the banks make about more than half their money through the balance sheet, and that's the difference between the spreads we lend money at and pay our depositors. And that as rates rise up, our zero interest deposits, which are a core part of our franchise and our low interest checking, obviously become a lot more valuable. And that's where you saw the, the strong gain in NII, not only year over year, but also late quarter, up over a billion plus from second quarter to third quarter. And we told people it would be up over a billion in the fourth quarter, a billion a quarter. And that, that's the earnings power coming back as the rate structure comes off the floor. It was that for a couple of years during the pandemic. Yeah, that guidance people appeared to like as well. So what level of rates do you need to see, Brian, to get expanding operating leverage and, and margins? Well, the level of rates is going to be determined by what the you know, Fed's doing to take out monetary accommodation. So you have to back up. And we're working against an economy which you know, is still solid now in terms of customer activity and what we're seeing. But our experts in Candace Browning Platt's research team, who often here on your show, you know, have <laughs> this the third quarter still positive. They had the fourth quarter, the first quarter, the second quarter, the third quarter next year is all slightly negative and it comes back to positive. And that they have a rate structure gets up to about five percent. So we don't need a rate structure. We're earning this much money today with the current rate structure and some of that's still to kick in. Uh, but, but the reality is if the rate structure is there because inflation's not gone too far and they can't get under control, you know, that, that has other issues in the balance sheet. So you've got to be careful what you wish for in the world that we're in in financial services. So our job is to meet anything, be prepared for everything. But the good news is the consumers and the, and, and the commercial activity still remains very solid deep into the, uh, the post-pandemic era. No, I think your comments on the consumer are really important, Brian, and they stand in, in contrast to what it feels like following the markets lately and in, and in other industries. So what are you seeing right now that's giving you so much confidence to talk about a strong consumer? So if we, if we back up, we have you know, 60 million consumer households. We have 35 million Americans core checking accounts where the money comes in from getting paid and they distribute to pay their bills. And we have their you know, 35 million plus credit cards and all the other things that come with that. And so if you look at that spending for the third quarter of 2000. 22 versus the third quarter of 2021, it was up about 10 percent, and transactions were up five and a half percent or so. If, as we look at the first couple of weeks of October, it's still up 10 percent. Now that's a tale. A little bit you got to be careful because earlier in the year it was growing faster, and as mm. as the you know the environments changed, they've slowed down a little bit, but still much faster. So if you think about maybe seven, 2017 or 18, it might have grown up five or six percent. It's still growing faster, which shows the consumer has money to spend. So number one, they're spending. Number two, they have have as much money in their accounts today as they did at, at the end of September as they did at the end of August. And that's interesting because most people believe they're spending it down and you don't see that yet. Now, is there stress for certain consumers out there? No question. But they're employed and earning money and their account balances at Bank of America continue to be uh, flat August to September for cohorts they, they had two to thousand, two to 5,000 before the pandemic, an average of 3,400. They're sitting with 13,000 account and it's not going down. It continues to be flattish and, and it was growing early in the year and now it's flat. That means they have money to spend. And then on top of that, they're employed and, and you can see the unemployment numbers are still very low. So you put that all together, the current environment of consumers is quite good and strong. When you go to the credit side of it, they have plenty of credit availability mm -hmm. and our charge offs and our credit delinquencies are still way below they were pre-pandemic. But even if you look at the best five year averages across the last you know, 30 years, they're still below that. And so that means the consumer, because they're employed, they're paying their bills. That's that's sort of basic stuff. Where it goes in the future, we're not reflecting on today as much as talking about what we see today. And then you go to commercial, it's the same. Uh, charge offs low and commercial, continued improvement in uh, reserve criticized loans or non-performers, all good stuff. Because because the environment's still strong. Now, are we dealing with issues all over the place? Absolutely. Are mm -hmm. we dealing with a higher rate structure? We'll drag the economy. That's what the Fed's trying to do. But right now, as you see the third quarter and the first part of October, it's, the consumer's hanging in there. It, it's just interesting because your counterpart over at JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, says that we're headed for a hurricane. And, and even your stock is down almost as much as the market. Before today, it was down more than the market on, on worries about a turn in the credit cycle and the economy. So it feels like even though what you're saying is good now, a lot worse is to come, but potentially into next year. Our, 
Yeah, but Sarah, so our reserves that we put up this quarter are built on a 5% unemployment in the fourth quarter of 22 and a 5.5% employment all during 23. That's how conservative in the reserve building. We put up those reserves already. So the idea is that the way the rules work and accounting works and everything, you're putting up based on scenarios. And our, our scenarios you know, weighted you know, 40% to at very adverse scenarios, which have high inflation and high unemployment built in. And when you average those together, the the, the the reserve is built on 5.5% unemployment. Mm -hmm. So we are prepared for the hurricane. We're prepared for the, whatever happens next. But the idea is we did that by what we call response growth across the last decade. So uh, how we distributed between commercial lending and consumer lending, how we built capital, how we built reserves, how we have in a commercial lending, you know, multiple uh, guardrails on how big a portfolio can become relative home, real estate exposure, all that stuff. So that's how you build a company yeah. is durable. And I think the banking industry overall is very durable right now. You've seen it through some interesting times over the last, you know, 24, 36 months, and the durability is supplied. And that's what's unique about the U.S., is we have a very durable, strong banking system, which is a buffer to some of these things that could go wrong. And they may go wrong, and they will go wrong, but the reality is we're all starting from a pretty mm -hmm. good place. So you don't deny that, there, that there's a hurricane coming, as, as Jamie Dimon predicts? Well, we, our, I, t I t start off by saying our core estimates are negative GDP growth for, for the fourth quarter, first quarter, second quarter, and third quarter, which, but it's a modest, shallow, and comes out towards the end of next year, accompanied by 5.5% unemployment. Yeah. But that's what we're, we built the company to sustain, and today we put up $7 billion plus in earnings, year-over-year -year growth, and, and so the environment is manageable if you're wise how you manage it, and that's what we do. We're always prepared for the next uh, thing, hopefully, and we continue to ask ourselves that question every day. What do you think about loan growth? How, how much longer can we actually see growth here from, from consumers and commercial? Well, we saw this quarter because the uh, stress test results that you've reported on and the surprise embedded in them, we tamped the brakes a little bit on some loan growth, especially in a large corporate business because we had to get our capital back up. And we're, now we have capital at the end of the third quarter equal to what we needed the first quarter of 24. So we're in great shape. And then we're going to drive through that so we can open the thing. So you're seeing... You're seeing uh, strong loan growth year over year, 12, 15 percent, those types of numbers. That's, that's not going to do. It's going to move back to be more in line with the you know, mid-single digits we've had. And if, you're, if you look at it, the originations, and we put that in the earnings package that people can look at, the earnings originations for whether it's credit cards or home equities, the FICO scores are 760. The loan to value of the, of the portfolio on the mortgage side is very low. It's, you know, we are originating strong credit, and we'll continue to do that. Is the demand going to change if, the, if we get more recessionary environment, which is what our economy Economists predict and what the economy predict, you're going to see loan demand shift down a little bit, mm -hmm. but that's already happened to some degree as line usage actually came down a little bit this quarter. But our job, and my teammates' jobs, our job at Bank of America is to drive through that, get new clients and get more done with them under responsible growth. So as you mentioned, clearly the regulators are making you hold back more capital, like, like what we're seeing with J.P. Morgan and others. Do you have any timing on that to hold, hold the, the timing of holding back buybacks and dividends and that use of cash given some of the regulatory requirements? Uh, we bought back shares this quarter, I mean third quarter, and we'll plan to buy back shares in the fourth quarter because we're already at the levels we need for the first quarter of 2024. So not only did we absorb the stress mm -hmm. capital buffer results, we've also uh, put up enough capital this quarter, 11 percent against the 10.9 requirement beginning in 2024. So we don't, we don't need to go build any capital. We may want to build a little more buffer. So we are going to, this quarter we bought back shares and we'll continue, meaning third quarter, and we'll buy in the fourth quarter and we'll continue to buy them back. But our capital is first use to support the organic growth of our clients and their, and their efforts, mm -hmm. and then we use it to pay dividends, and then we use it to buy back stock, and we're already doing it. So this isn't like we have to build anything. We're past the minimums we need out there a year ahead in the future, and, and frankly, those minimums uh, shouldn't change. Brian Moynihan, thank you so much for taking the time today.